Many of you know that I grew up in the country of Spain, in a small town in northern Spain called Ruvena, outside of Burgos. The thing about Spain is that we had one sport that we played and one sport only. We played soccer. There was another, no other sport that uh, rivaled soccer. In the village, we'd kick around cans. We'd have a, uh, we'd, we'd, we'd have a, a soccer ball. Uh, everybody was into soccer. That was the dominant sport. And there are two teams in Spain, one in northern Spain, one in southern Spain. In, in, well, middle Spain. Middle Spain is Real Madrid. And northern Spain is Barcelona. I'm actually a Barcelona fan, so for those of you Real Madrid, and those of you that are American and just play American football, you're like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, but for high school, I came one year to the States to go to high school. I was 15 years old, and uh, I, I noticed that they had a lot of sports that I wasn't familiar with. One of those was wrestling. I'd never wrestled. I'd never seen wrestling, but I thought, I'm going to sign up and do some wrestling. And so as 15-year-old, I signed up to do wrestling, and I'll never forget our first training. I got out there and started to wrestle. The first uh, meet that we had, I wrestled a guy, and afterwards, the coach came to me, and he said, Job, I got to tell you something. You need to learn, you never, never reach back. I said, what do you mean? He said, you just never reach back. I said, well, when someone's on my back trying to take me down, I'm trying to reach back to get them on my back. He said, no, no, you never reach back because when you reach back, that leaves you vulnerable because then the guy can take your arm and he can twist your arm. And once he's got your arm because you've reached back, he can easily pin you. So listen to me. He looked at me and he said, never, never reach back. Today, I want to talk to you about never, never reach back. Some of you are pinned spiritually right now, struggling spiritually right now, defeated spiritually right now, with the enemy over you right now because you've reached back. And God is telling you, never, never reach back. I want you to take your Bibles today and turn to Exodus chapter 30. For those of you that are new to your Bibles, it's the second book of the Bible. The first book is the book of Genesis. The second book is the book of Exodus. Genesis means beginning. Exodus means, well, what it sounds like to exit. Because about 1.5 million Hebrews exited the land of Egypt where they were slaves heading towards a land of freedom, the promised land that God was calling them towards. I'm going to begin reading in Exodus chapter 32. Let me set the scenario for you. The people of Israel have been set free miraculously by the hand of God. They've been through the Red Sea. Manna has come from heaven. They've seen this powerful miraculous, divine, supernatural liberation by the hand of Moses, who is literally brought to their knees the most powerful nation on earth. Now, they're in the desert. God has promised them, I'm going to take you to a land that will be your own. You will inhabit it. You will defeat the enemy. You will possess that land. By the way, that land right now is in the middle of major, major turmoil and conflict. It's all over the news right now, but that is another story. But that land that God promised Israel, they said, I will take you to the land. I will deposit you in that land so you have a destiny that you are going to. As they were heading to that destiny, God said to the people of Israel, God said to Moses, Moses, I want you to stop here. I want you to pause Because I'm about to give you some rules to manage this people by. And you know the story. God called Moses up to this holy mountain, Mount Horeb. 
There was a glow of fire around that mountain. The people were told, don't touch the mountain, don't step on it, or your life will be taken away from you. This is a holy mountain, and Moses is about to go up into that mountain and have a face-to-face meeting with God. And you remember he received the Ten Commandments there and received guidance about how to guide a nation, and he said, he will be back, so wait here. So we pick up this story while the people of Israel are waiting for Moses to come down from the mountain. Ten days had passed, 20 days had passed, 25 days had passed, 30 days had passed, and Moses is still in the mountain. Here's what it says. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered themselves together to Aaron, who was Moses' brother, and they said to him, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. I want to talk to you about how not to reach back and some observations of why we reach back. Number one, if you're taking notes, write this down. Seasons of waiting give way to discontentment and become the open door for us to reach back. Notice it was during a time of waiting. They were waiting for Moses. They were becoming impatient. They were becoming frustrated. They felt like we need to move on, but where is Moses? We thought we're on our way to the promised land, but now we're on pause. We have a destination to get to, but it doesn't seem like we're getting there anytime soon. You know, some of the times where we most struggle are between the promise and the delivery of the promise. Sometimes the places that we most start to doubt, become frustrated, impatient, is when we are waiting. I don't know about you, but I'm a bad waiter. Anybody else here kind of bad at waiting? I mean, I go to the doctor's office. They say you have to get there early, and then they make me wait longer. It's kind of like, hey, who's the sick person here? Go to the grocery store, and there's someone in front of you. It always seems to happen. The person, God bless her heart, but the lady that has like 10 coupons, it's like, ah, one more. Let me find it in my purse at the bottom. I got to dig it out. Long conversations like, ah. I'm at a stop stoplight. I tell my wife, I think the stoplight's broken. It's just been way too long. I, I don't like to wait. But let me tell you what happens sometimes when we're waiting. Some of you right now, today, as I speak, you're in the waiting room. Maybe it's the waiting room for a marriage to turn around that seems like it's been stuck for a long time. Maybe it's in the waiting room of singleness where you've just been praying and believing that God would bring someone and it's just not happening. Maybe it's in the waiting room of a prodigal son or daughter that you expect to come back and it just seems to be getting worse. Maybe it's in the waiting room of a job situation that you thought would turn around but it's just prolonged itself over and over and over again. Maybe it's in the waiting room of trying to come out of a season of darkness or depression or emotional instability, and it feels like it never ends. I don't know what your waiting room is. But sometimes in the middle of our waiting room is when the enemy comes in and begins to speak to us, discouraging lies, and it's in the middle of the waiting room oftentimes that we blow it. While they were waiting, it says that Moses delayed And so the people of Israel came to Aaron and they said, hey, we don't know where Mo is at. We don't know if he's coming back. We don't know if an animal has gotten, gotten him or if he decided to flee or run. We don't know where he's at. But we want, we want, listen to what they say. Listen, but make us gods that will go before us. 
hold on. I thought you had a God that delivered you from the land of Egypt. Suddenly, they say, hey, make us some gods that will go before us. They still wanted to be led, but they were not sure they wanted to be led by the God of Moses. And here's what I want you to know. Sometimes you can be in the waiting room and you could be start to listen to the wrong voices. And when you listen to the wrong voices, you will be tempted to compromise and get out of that waiting room through the wrong door. I was at O'Hare Airport a little while back and I had a speaking engagement that I was flying to and I had to get there on time and I did something unusual. I arrived a, over an hour and a half early to my domestic flight. I thought I got plenty of time. I got some work to do. I pulled out my computer. I went right to the gate and I sat down right next door to the uh, gate where we would be boarding the plane. And I just started working on some stuff that I had. There were other people that were supposed to be on the flight right next to me. And I'm working and working and saying, I haven't heard them call my name. This must be delayed flight like it's usual at O'Hare. And I'm working away. I said, all right, let me go. Just go hit the restroom. And I look at this, the, the sign above the door and it said, departed. I went up to the guy and I said, excuse me, departed. What exactly does that mean? <laughs> well, sir, the plane has left. I said, I've been 10 feet away from this gate. I never heard one announcement. I never heard anybody say anything about it. And there were four other people with me that also missed the plane. I said, these people didn't hear it either. I'm not sure what's going on. How could we have missed the plane? He just looked at me and said, you did, sir. And what I realized is, listen, I was in the waiting room. First time it ever happened to me. I was in the waiting room, but I wasn't listening to the right voice. And because I wasn't listening to the right voice, I missed my plane and I almost missed my appointment. I literally arrived 15 minutes after the meeting had started and just changed at a Dunkin' Donuts right there and set into my appointment. But I was in the waiting room listening for the wrong voice. And because I didn't hear the right voice, I almost missed my destination. Listen, some of you are in the waiting room right now. I don't know what waiting room you're in right now, but some of you are in the waiting room listening to the wrong voice like the people of Israel were, getting discontent, unsatisfied, and it's very tempting to get out of your waiting room through the door of compromise. The people of Israel wanted to get out of the waiting room waiting on God through the door of compromise because it was taken way too long. Number two, write this down. Often our stumbling blocks can be built from the very breakthroughs that we prayed for. The Bible tells us in verse two, so Aaron said to them, the people of Israel said, we're tired of waiting. We want other gods. Aaron who should have been turning them back to God. He compromised. He listened to the people instead of listening to God. You're in dangerous hands when there's a leader that is more concerned about what people think than what God thinks. The fear of man, as opposed to the fear of God, is the beginning of a downfall. Can I tell you something very clearly? As a pastor, I'm not called to be a politician. I'm called to be a pastor. I'm called to preach the word of God, whether it's popular or unpopular. I'm called to speak the truth from the word of God, whether it clashes with the values of our culture or not. And sometimes the message of the word of God is not well received from the broader population out there. As a preacher of the word of God and a pastor of the word of God, I have to be true to the authority, authoritative, inspired, infallible word of God. And I need to preach it whether it offends people or doesn't offend people, whether it's in season or out of season, because I need to fear God more than I, I fear people. I am aghast at some of the things that are being preached from the pulpits of Christian churches around this nation. 
that have nothing to do with the word of God, that are really a caving in to the culture around us, a compromising of the word of God, a popular just massaging of the truth of the word of God and trying to give uh, the general culture what they want to hear as opposed to preaching what the word of God actually says. Aaron should have pointed the people right back to God and said, you need to listen to the word of God. God liberated you, but instead Aaron feared people more than he feared God. And the Bible tells us that when they came to Aaron, Aaron said, take off the rings of gold that are in your ears, the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off their rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. Verse 4, and he received the gold from their hand and he fashioned it with the graving tool and he made a golden calf. Now let me pause there for a second. There's so much that's wrong with that right now. But let me just point out a couple of things. Number one, a leader that compromised a leader, leader that, uh, that was afraid of the people, that was looking for popularity more than what he was looking to be true to God. Maybe he thought they were going to have a rebellion against him. Maybe he thought that if he pointed them back to God, they would stone him. But instead of standing and saying, what are you doing, people? Let's turn back to God. He caved in to their desires. I asked myself this question as I read this passage. These were people that had been in slavery for 400 years. They were bricklayers. They were impoverished people. They had been dominated. They were stripped of their possessions. Where did they get all this gold from? Well, if you remember, if you read in Exodus chapter 12, it tells us where they got this gold from. Do you remember that when the people of Israel called out to God, God had made a promise to Abraham that he was going to provide a land and provide wealth for them. When the people of Israel, these enslaved people, after the end of the plagues had happened, the people of Egypt were so happy to get rid of the Hebrews that the people of Israel actually gave them jewelry and gave them gold to get out of the land. It tells us in Exodus chapter 12, verse 36, and the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let them have what they asked for. Thus, they plundered the Egyptians. The gold that they had was an answer to the prayer that they had prayed. God provide for us. God liberate us. God set us free. And God had answered their prayer by supernaturally opening up the treasure coffers of the Egyptians and letting these slaves go with tons of gold out into the, out into the desert. It was a direct answer to prayer. Now, listen to this. Only a few months later, what had been their answer to prayer was being turned into an idol. Now, let me say that again. Only a few months later, the source of their answer to prayer was now, what had meant to bless them, was now turned into a curse against them because they mismanaged the blessing that God had given them. They took what God had given them as an answer to prayer, and now they were turning it into an idol in their lives that would take them away from God. I'm talking to someone here today. Do you know that you can pray for something, fast for something, and God can give you that something And then once you have that something, you can become so obsessed with that something that you elevate that something above God. And the very something that God gave you now becomes a stumbling block to your walk with God because it becomes the center of your life and an idol to your life that actually takes you away from the living God. The Bible tells us that Aaron took all the gold He put it all together and he 
fashioned out of it a golden calf. Now you say, why a golden calf? Well, the gods of the Egyptians, they had, the Egyptians had multiple gods in those days. But one of their popular gods was a god that was, uh, there were two gods, a goddess and a god. And one of the goddess, gods that they had was the god of Apis, called Apis, that was represented in the form of a calf. The Canaanites' fertility god later become a, became an evolution of that that we call Baal. There was another Egyptian goddess called Hathor that represented a number of things to the Egyptians, including dance, music, love, sexuality, maternity. Uh, she was typically depicted with two, in two different ways, as a woman with the headdress of a cow and sometimes entirely as a cow goddess. So when the Egyptians asked for a god to lead them forward, what had been their answer to prayer, their blessing, was turned into a pagan idol that would lead them astray because they were reaching back. I remember years ago talking to a young man that was coming out of a bad background of addiction. And um, God had liberated him from addiction, set him free from addiction, walking in, in liberty, um, walking and leaving it behind. People were amazed that he had left his drugs and addiction behind and was walking with sobriety and freedom and uh, mentoring and growing in God. But, you know, he wanted, he wanted to be in a relationship and he wanted, to, he wanted to date and it wasn't happening as fast as he thought it could happen. It wasn't happening. He was in the waiting period. And so he decided to go out with some of his older buddies and friends. And, and, and he said, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to get high. I'm not going to drink. I'm just going to have club soda. And so he went out to the old place that he used to hang out, just having club soda and hung out with them. He was looking for something. He was waiting. He was discontent that he was uh, waiting and it hadn't happened yet. And he went out a few different times. And then one day I got a phone call and on the other side of the line was a slurred voice. And pastor, can you come and tell? I said, bro, is this you? And I said his name and yeah, this is me. what happened? And I went up to pick, pick him up. His eyes were red. His voice was slurred. His eyes were, he was crying as he told me that he had walked in sobriety for such a long time, but he fell back into his old uh, drinking habits. He got high where he had walked in liberty for a long time. You know why? Because he reached back. He was in the waiting period. He wanted a relationship. He figured it's not coming easy to me, so I'm going to reach back a little bit, just a little bit. I'm not going to compromise. I'm going to reach back. And before you know it, his reaching back had allowed the enemy to take his arm, and the enemy took his arm and pinned him, and now he was actually the very thing that had set him free, the very thing that he wanted had become reaching back, and now he was struggling spiritually because he was in the waiting room seeking to reach back into his old lifestyle. I run into a lot of people like the people of Israel that God answers your prayer and you take the very answer to prayer that God has given you and if you're not careful, the very thing that was a blessing to you at one time now becomes your idol. I was speaking to someone a little while back that I remember when they had come and they had prayed that God would give them a job, that they needed a breakthrough in their job. They needed a provision and God gave them a job and they came and celebrated with me that God had given them a job. They were so happy about it and the job had possibilities and open doors and they were making more money than they had made in a long time and play the movie forward a year and a half later. I couldn't see that person anymore. Didn't run into that person. Finally ran into that person and said, hey, bro, where you been? Oh, pastor, my job. You mean the job that we prayed for? 
yeah, that job, man, really going good, just going up the ladder, but it's really busy, and, and it's just really consume my time, really taking up a lot of my effort and my energy and my time, and they asked me to do this and travel and work. Are you in a small group? No. Are you going to church? No. Are you involved in ministry? No. How's your spiritual life? Pretty bad. Well, what happened? Oh, pastor, it's the job. You mean the job that God opened up the door for, the job that God gave you? Now that job has become the main thing in your life, and God has become number four, five, or six later, you see the very answer to our prayer, if not careful, but can become the idol which derails us from our walk with God. Number three, when our hearts stray, we start attributing to idols what ultimately only belongs to God. Notice what it says. The people of Israel, the Hebrews, it said, and they said, these are your gods. When the golden calf had emerged from the fire, the people of Israel said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. Hold on. Wait a second. You mean the God that parted the Red Sea, the God that did miracles, the God that brought plagues, the, the God that delivered manna, the God that turned the bitter water into water that could be drunk, the God that's done miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle, the God that set people free from 400 years of slavery only a few months after it because you had to wait a while. Now you create a golden calf and you said, this is the God that took you out of Israel? Can I tell you something? If we don't guard our heart, it can quickly flip. If you don't guard your heart, it can quickly flip. The Bible tells us that suddenly the people of Israel pointed to this golden calf and said, this is, these are the gods that have brought you out of Egypt. Verse 5. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. And when he talks about the Lord, it's very vague terminology. Is it the Lord calf? Is it the Lord Yahweh? Which Lord is it? And, we, and he made a feast before the Lord, and they rose up early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat, drink, and they rose up to play. So imagine what's happening. Now you have the people of Israel celebrating to the God that took them out of Egypt, but there's a golden calf there. They're mixing the worship of Yahweh with the worship of the golden calf. They're mixing pagan practices with godly practices, and now they're saying, these are who has brought us out of Egypt. Listen to me well. Hear me. This is really important. Missiologists, those that study missions and the progress of missions in other countries, they call what the people of Israel are doing here, they call it syncretism. Syncretism is the mixing of old beliefs with new beliefs. In Christianity, it's when the gospel goes forward, but you don't quite release what you believe before and you mix what you believe before with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you come up with your own concoction. Syncretism is when you are unwilling to let completely go of the past. And you try to bring the past into your present. And you mix them together. Syncretism is the process by which aspects of one's religion are assimilated or blended with your previous religion. Now you have the people of Israel with the golden calf on one side and God on the other side, and they're saying, these are the gods that have brought us out of Egypt. You know, it's very easy to do that in our own lives when we're not fully willing to let go. I've seen it happen over and over 
we start to attribute that which only belongs to God to other things. I've seen, I've seen God work in unusual, miraculous ways. I've seen people's lives be transformed here at New Life Community Church. We've, we've literally seen thousands of lives changed. Thousands. People that you would barely recognize now because when God got a hold of them, they were messy. And God has washed them, cleaned them up, gotten them on solid ground. Sociologists call it redemption and lift. Typically when you are redeemed and you start living in the right way, there's a lift that happens economically. There's a lift that happens in your life. Suddenly you start buying houses, start getting cars and start prospering and start moving up. Why? Because your life is in order now. There's a blessing that comes with order and hard work and suddenly redemption and lift begins to happen in our lives. And I've seen people when God has gotten a hold of their lives, if they don't keep their heart right, it's easy to start to attribute to other things the glory that only God should get. We can easily attribute it to other things when ultimately it was God. I've seen it happen. The person that was a mess, downtrodden, depressed, bound by addiction, confused, disoriented in life. They come to God and they clean up and they stop living with the girlfriend and they get married and they provide a household and start to educate their children the right way and they get a house now because they have a job and they start to go to school and they get a degree and they move to a better neighborhood because the old neighborhood was not a great environment for them to be raised in. And so they're in a better neighborhood and better schools and better jobs and better degrees and better cars and they prospered. And someone then asked them later on, hey, how did, how, did, how did this happen? Where did it come from? Oh, you know, I had a friend that got me a job and when I got that job, I made a lot of money. So grateful to my job. And, you know, I've been able to prosper. And this neighborhood has helped me to make it and provide a better life and, and a good job and a good schooling for my children. I'm so grateful for the job that God gave me that's really helped me turn my life around. Wait a second. I hear a lot of glory to your job. What about the God that redeemed you? The God that fixed your heart so you could even have a job. The God that took you out of addiction so you could show up on Sunday morning. The God that turned your heart to your wife so that you would be married. The God that gave you ability to think and work and believe. The God that provided, the God that gave you health, the God that gave you direction, the God that took you out of darkness, the God that gave hope in your life, the God that gave you energy, the God that gave you health. Shouldn't he be the one that receives the glory? Shouldn't he be the one that we praise to and point to? You see, if you're not careful, you can start to attribute to idols that which only God deserves. And the people of Israel had started to attribute to a gold calf that which only the king of kings and the Lord of lords deserved. Number four, we deceive ourselves into thinking that our spiritual decline just happened to us instead of being the result of our choices. So the Bible tells us that finally, after 40 days, Moses, who's been in the Mount Horeb receiving the Ten Commandments from God, decides to come down from the mountain of God. Now, isn't it ironic that the very things that God was putting on the tablets of the Ten Commandments, the people who were just yards away were violating? You could be close to Revelation and not necessarily understand that that revelation is for you. You could be close to the word of God and the revelation of God and still be living in rebellion towards God. 
Just nearness to revelation doesn't mean that it affects your life. Hello? You can have a godly mother, but it doesn't mean that you live godly. You can have a church that praises God and preaches the word, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're living in the path that God calls you to. Nearness to revelation doesn't necessarily mean that you are walking in revelation. So Moses is receiving the Ten Commandments, but just hundreds of yards away, the people are in this basically one big drunken party in the name of their gods. So Moses starts to come down from the mountain. He's been in the presence of God. He's got this glow about him. He has the tablets of the Ten Commandments in his hands. He's going down ready to preach to the people, excited about their future. And Joshua meets him halfway down the mountain because he didn't go up all the way. And Joshua thinks it's a battle cry that he, he thinks... People are battling. There's war. And Moses listens and says, no, this isn't war. This is a party. The people of Israel are in one big, massive party. They're getting down. The music is blaring. The ladies are dancing. There's a lot of drinking going on. The Bible says, and they arose to play. And that, when it says they arose to play, they weren't playing Monopoly. This has with it the connotations of sexual play. This was one big club happening. The techno music is going. They're dancing and prancing. They're getting a little loose and wild. And they're doing it all in, a, in the name of God. And Moses hears the sound and the people. And, the, and he's coming down with the Ten Commandments full of God's strength and glory and he walks in, and when he looks around, all he sees is one massive party. All the people have decided that they're just going to let loose, go party, worship the golden calf. By the way, the, golden, the goddess uh, calf of the Egyptians was the goddess of sexuality, the goddess of dance, the goddess of music. So may, some scholars believe that they were just, this was part of their celebration, this was part of their worship. And as Moses comes down from the mountain, he is so consumed with the anger of God as he sees how quickly these people have walked away from God that he actually throws the Ten Commandments, the tablets on the ground, and they break at the foot of the mountain. This is the first set of the Ten Commandments. And Moses sees his brother Aaron and he says to him, what did this people do to you that you have brought such sin upon them? And Aaron said, hey, don't be mad at me. You know the people. They're all set on evil. For they said to me, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, the man who he brought us out of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Listen to what Aaron says. So I said to them, let any of you who has gold take it off. Listen. So they, gave to, so they gave me all the gold. I threw it into the fire and out came this calf. Man, does he sound like us. Hey, Mo, don't get mad at your bro. I mean, I just took all this gold, threw it into the fire and boom, out came a calf. Well, that's not exactly how it happened. Because if we see a few verses earlier, the Bible says that Aaron took a tool and he formed a calf. Let me tell you something. Many of us act like our spiritual decline just happened to us. How did you get to the place... How did you get to the place where you're at right now? I don't know. It just happened. No, it doesn't just happen. It happens one choice at a time. It happens one compromise at a time. One act of disobedience at a time. We don't just throw it in and out pops the, the, the golden calf. We carve the golden calf. We make choices in our life. 
Now you can excuse it and act like you don't know how it happened, how you ended up where you're at. Hey, what happened to you? You used to be on fire living for God. What happened to you? You're living like you barely know God. Well, I don't know. I just kind of happened. No, it didn't happen. It happened one choice at a time. It happened one disobedience at a time. It happened one conviction at a time that you ignored. It happened one sin at a time that you chose not to repent of. As your heart started to get harder and harder and harder, as you made choices that you knew were against God, and then you wake up one day and you're worshiping the golden calf, but it did not just happen. It happened because of choices. Can I tell you something? Let me just be real honest with you. Repentance starts when we take ownership for our condition. Let me say that again. There can be no repentance unless we're willing to take ownership for our decisions. I remember sitting down with a married man years ago and saying, bro, what happened? Well, my wife wants to leave me. You know, she's been bitter for a long time. She's just nasty attitude, just You know, never happy, nothing that I do. No, no, I'm talking about you, not your wife. Oh, me, pastor? Yeah, you. I'm talking about you and the affair that you had with the girl that's 20 years younger than you at your job. I'm talking about how'd that happen, pastor? I don't know. It just, you know, it just happened. I mean, before I knew it, we're like involved. I mean, I don't know. I I didn't plan it. I didn't do anything. I'm just a... Innocent bystander. Oh, so the time that you invited out to lunch, oh, that was innocent, Pastor. I was just kind of getting to know a coworker. When you gave her her number and said, hey, why don't you meet me at this party? You know, I was just a bunch of guy. No, 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 no. Don't tell me that it just happened. You will never turn back unless you take responsibility and ownership for your part and your disobedience. Repentance happens when you take ownership and you say, I made it happen. I chose to go down this road. I made the phone call. I pursued her. I invited her out. I turned away from the wife of my youth. I broke the covenant. I slept with her because I chose to sleep with her. I manipulated her into thinking that I was going to leave my wife. Hey, it never repentance never happens until you take absolute ownership of the decisions that you have made. And then God can restore our heart. But it happens with ownership. And lastly, let me close with this. The day comes when we must make a clear choice to follow God's way and to pursue his his destiny or listen, or to walk away from God. Verse 25, Moses was mad. God was mad. God is a jealous God in a good way. I want God to be jealous. I want him to have a relationship that he says, I want. And I will share you with no other. The Bible says that God told Moses, Moses, I think I'm done with these people. Let me just wipe them out. Start all over with you. But God is a God of covenant. Moses reminds God, God, remember you made a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. that You're going to make a great people, a great nation. It's going to go places. So God honored that covenant. But God said, you know, we need to bring clarity here. People have to choose, am I with God or against God? The Bible says that Moses got up in the middle of of the people. Some of them were still following the calf. And he says, today you need to decide, are you with God or not with God? 
Are you with the God that led you out of? And a whole bunch of people stood up with Moses and a whole bunch of people went against Moses. And that day, 3,000 people died and a plague was unleashed on those people. And there was consequences and judgment that was brought on those people as God cleared the house because there were certain people on that day that decided, I'm not going to follow God. But others that said, I will courageously, boldly repent of what I've done. And I'm going to turn and say, I'm 100% following God. Can I tell you something? There's a time in our life, especially there are key moments in our life where we have to stand up and say, I will follow God. I heard at the men's encounter retreat yesterday, men stand up and say, this is what I heard. And I'm going to hold them to it, by the way. I know your names. Got your telephone numbers. I heard a bunch of men stand up and say, I've been living with my girlfriend. I'm a follower of Jesus now. I realize that's wrong. I'm going to marry her. I'm planning on marrying her. A bunch of men. You know what? They don't have to do that. You know why they're doing that? Because they're basically saying, they're not saying, what they are saying is, because I'm following God, I'm going to do things God's way. That's what they're saying. So, hey, ladies, it may not seem super romantic, but some of us know before you know that your, that your fiancé is going to propose to you. Um, but they're doing it not just because they love you. They're doing it because they want to follow God and follow God's way. And that's a great reason to do it. There's a time and a moment that people need to stand up and say, I'm following God, and that means in my life that I'm going to have to break this relationship, be honest with this person, let go of that addiction, join a Celebrate Recovery group, get baptized, say I'm going to marry my wife, stop fooling around, follow Jesus with all the intentions that it makes. You know, that's what it means to follow Jesus sometimes. There has to be a line in the sand where people stand up and say, I'm following Jesus, and I know there's consequences to my decision, but I'm willing to go all the way in following Jesus. Listen, some of you want to follow Jesus, but you also want the golden calf, and you're living halfway in God and halfway in the world. You got this syncretistic thing going on where you want a little God, but you want a little of the world. You, have, you want the favor of the God upstairs, but you want the pleasure of the world down here. You want enough of God to open doors, but you want enough of the world to give you a good time on Friday night. And I, all I'm saying is you got to decide. You got to decide who you're going to follow. You got to decide, are you on God's side or not? You got to decide to whom do you belong? Do you belong to God or the world? You got to cross the line. You have to make a choice. And the Bible said that these people had to make a choice. Moses stood up and said, whoever's on God's side, come over here. And if you're not, you're over there. There was a choice that had to be made. And there's times in our life where God is saying, make a choice. You can come to church and not belong to God. Let me say that again. Just because your family comes to church, just because you come with your family, just because you know the songs. Hey, listen, and just because you know me by name, Pastor Mark, doesn't mean you're a believer. It just means you're hanging out with believers. Hey, I know people that go to the gym, they buy the outfit, they get the drinks, they have the app that tells them everything. And you know what I see them doing? They're just always chatting with people in the gym like this, you know, and chatting. I never see them work out ever. Just kind of chatting, socializing. Hey, just because you go to the gym doesn't mean you're in shape. It just means you're hanging out with the gym. Oh, you know all the gym lingo. You know all the gym outfits. I think some people just go for the outfits. They just want to have the gym outfit. And then the selfie. You know, some of you are taking picture with the equipment behind you. You never use that equipment. You, 
You're just taking the picture with the equipment there, but you don't use it. Doesn't mean that you're in shape. You can fool other people. If people watch you long enough, they know you hang out with the gym, but you're really not in shape. And can I tell you something? Yeah. Listen, this is not meant to, this is not a condemnation to push you away. This is a draw to bring you in closer. And you can be here in the church and you can learn the songs and you can wave your hand and you can have a Bible and you can know my name and you can be in this, but you got to cross a line that says I belong to Jesus if you're going to be part of the family of the living God.